first I have to apologize to Judy. I went over her and talked to her like she's never been here before, and she's been here longer than I have. So, I'm sorry, Judy. If the Lord graces me and punishes you with the ability to preach to you on a regular basis, you'll hear three themes repeated in all of my sermons, regardless of the subject. Text, context, and the deleterious influence of American concepts on Christianity. It doesn't matter what gospel I'm going to be talking about. Those three things are going to crop up to some degree, one way or another. Because as ministers, it's the text. It's all about the text. It's nothing but the text. Because the text communicates to us the gospel. See, the text communicates to us that we are, in our depravity, fallen and alienated from God. It is the text that tells us that it is Jesus in his active, obedient life to the law, in perfection of obedience to the law, in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, resolves that alienation between us and God, and that is the only resolution of that alienation. It is the text of God's infallible, inerrant word that gives us the gospel and nothing else. And because that text is so important, the context helps expound. It illuminates what that gospel is. And in many cases, we have to strip ourselves, we have to denude ourselves and separate ourselves from an American reading of the text, because the text, this book, is not an American book. This is a Jewish book. And unless we understand the mind of the God that wrote this book, we're not going to understand the text. A biblical understanding of fairness is not an American understanding of fairness. The Bible understands fairness as you get what you deserve. The American understanding of fairness is we not only do not get what we deserve, but we are all supposed to be treated, uh, we're all supposed to be exactly the same. We're not supposed to be treated based upon what we do, fairly. We're not supposed to be treated Justly, we're supposed to be made equal, not treated equally. That brings us to this morning's gospel. There is a tremendous amount of material here, and every time I say that, my wife cringes because she then braces herself for a 45-minute lecture. And I promise that I won't go 45 minutes. 44, but not 45. But as we look at this morning's text, let me read the gospel because it is connected directly to what Mark has previously said in chapter 7, and the two are intimately linked. This morning's gospel, Mark tells us in those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude. Because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. Then his disciples answered him, well, How can one satisfy these people with the bread here in the wilderness? He asked, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves, gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before them, and they set them before the multitude. They also had a few small fishes, and having blessed them, he said, and he set to them also before them. So they ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000, and then he sent them away. May God bless the reading of his word. This is the context 
of this morning's gospel. And it is connected directly to what Mark wrote in chapter 7. Let me read a few verses from that so that we can make this connection. In chapter 7, verses 24 through 30, he rose, Jesus rose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and that should kind of send up red flags because the biblical references to Tyre are ominous. He entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he couldn't be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For this saying, go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. When you look at the context of this passage, Jesus had been ministering in the region of Tyre, Sidon, and the Decapolis. Now these are primarily pagan Gentile areas. I'm not going to unpack this. There's a lot here. Uh, later on in Trinity season we get into this, so hopefully I'll have a chance to go over it there. But suffice to say that this was a place of significant historical and prophetic import as well as a true representation of fallen, pagan, spiritual oppression. Tyre was one of the largest Canaanite representations of idolatry, and they worshipped Ashtarte, who was to be honored by human sacrifice. This is the region in which Jesus is ministering the Decapolis, or the Ten Cities, was a mixture of G uh, Jewish and pagan Gentiles located on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now what you have to realize is that in chapter 7, Jesus is in Tyre and Sidon. Chapter 8, he's in the Decapolis. In other words, in chapter 7, Jesus is on the Santa Monica Pier. And in chapter 8, he's in Loma Linda. Think about the journey that he has traveled. These people had been following him from there to here. Imagine what type of ministry. Imagine the charisma, the power, the force of his persona to get a crowd that continually multiplied and grew day after day as he traveled that distance. Not only that, but he's in this northern region of Israel which is replete. It is infested with false pagan idolatry. Why is that significant? Well, remember when Jesus came he stated what the purpose of his ministry was all about. Remember what he said in Matthew 10, 6, and 15, 24? He came for whom? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. What's he doing in these Gentile areas? Why is he ministering to the Jews in Jerusalem? What's he doing amongst all these pagans? And on top of that, here he is in his house where he can't stay hidden. He can't get privacy for a second. And this Gentile pagan woman keeps pestering him. Not only does she keep pestering him, when she sees him, this Gentile pagan woman drops to her face. Think about that. Here's a pagan woman paying homage to a Jewish prophet. And she stays on her face. 
And they didn't have real fancy linoleum tile in their houses at the time. So she's down at Jesus' feet with her face in the dirt, and she keeps asking Jesus, please remove the demon from my daughter. Now, did she believe Jesus was the Messiah? We have no clue. Did she have any idea that Jesus was the second person of the incarnate triune Godhead? We have no idea. But we knew this, that she had enough faith that what Jesus said would be done. So she throws herself at his feet and begs for his intercession. So what does Jesus do? Like the good politician that he is, the man who knows how to win friends and influence people, he looks at her and he says, sweetheart, don't worry about it. I'll take care of everything. Throw a little couple coins in the, the jar here. We'll pat him back, vote for me in the next coming prophetic election, and I'll be more than happy to take care of whatever you want. Is that what he said? He referred back to what he had told everyone the purpose of his ministry was to be, and he said, it is not good that the bread to be given to the children should be thrown to the little dogs. The dogs in the house that were under the table yapping and nipping heels, begging for food. Could Jesus have been more insulting to this woman? But upon further analysis, he's really not insulting her. Yes, Jesus came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yes, he had to minister to them first. Everybody who paid attention to Scripture knew that at some point the, the Gentiles would receive the grace of Christ, just not in precedent before the Jews. So Jesus is reminding her, in all intents and purposes, it's just not your time yet. You need to wait. Then and only then will the little dogs be fed. Only then will the Gentiles receive the grace of God. Well, you have to admire the mother of this daughter. Did she take that as an answer? She turned it around on Jesus. I defy you to go through Scripture and find anywhere else, in any other encounter where anyone turned anything around on Jesus. And her response to him was instructive to all of us. Yes, Lord. I get it. I know who I am. I know my place. But even we little dogs feed on the scraps that fall from the master's table. Now in the parallel passage, Jesus turns around to those that were with him who, that, who were Jewish. And he says to them at that point, this, I'm paraphrasing, this Gentile pagan idolater has demonstrated more faith than anyone I have encountered in the nation of Israel. By her simple acknowledgement of her place, in the kingdom of God. Because what we are seeing here in the metaphor of the bread, and it was actual bread, I'm not saying that Jesus wasn't uh, feeding them bread, but we are, what we are seeing is a foreshadowing, a depiction of Christ, the bread of life, and his dispensing, his distributing his grace to those around him. And she was begging for his grace. And he honored her faith by giving her that grace prior to the coming time of the Gentiles to receive it. 
And this particular passage in Mark 7 should be familiar to all of you in one sense. We say a form of it every Sunday. We're going to say a form of it today. Do you recall where we say this? We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, right? But in thy manifold and great mercies. So what's the point? We are not worthy. repeating the words of a pagan at that point. Because it is a reminder of our sin before Christ and our unworthiness. And it is only because of his sacrifice and his blood and his grace that we can even be here. Jesus is foreshadowing his prophetic pronouncement that he is the bread of life. And then we come to this chapter, Mark 8, and we've got this huge crowd following him from Santa Monica to Loma Melinda. This multitude just keeps growing and growing. And he had just interacted with this pagan woman and cast the demon out of the daughter. And in the very next section of Mark chapter 7, he actually took a man who had been mute from birth and healed him. In this pagan region, Jesus is manifesting that he is the Son of God. All in a Gentile, not Jewish population. Three days they were with him. And after three days, Jesus' response is he looks around and he says, I have compassion for these people. And this is one of those cases where no matter what language you speak, you can never capture what the Greek says. The Greek word here, splagignomai, you like that one? Splagignomai? I'm going to be a quiz later on, so remember that. Indicates that the compassion that Jesus is experiencing is something, and this is what the Greek actually means, it's something that gushes, it ushers from his very bowels. In other words, the compassion that Jesus felt came from the depths, the core of his essence. The second person of the triune Godhead, incarnate on earth, assuming human nature, comes to the multitude and expresses a compassion that transcends human understanding. And not only does it transcend this human understanding, he wants to care for them. And he says, we got to feed these people. And he's not just talking about bread. We've already seen what the foreshadowing in chapter 7 indicates. He's not just talking about bread. So he tells his disciples, what are we going to do about this? And these guys that have been with him, and they probably read Mark chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5, have seen multitudes following Jesus everywhere. And it isn't as if Jesus hasn't done this before. He fed 5,000 in Mark chapter 6, and they're sitting there going, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. They're like the crows on the phone line. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Let's do something. Okay, what do you want to do? I mean, this is what these guys are saying. And you can almost see in the narrative Jesus going, how many loaves you got? Seven. Bring them. A couple small fishes thrown in. Jesus grabs the stuff. And in this pagan, fallen, idolatrous location 
with this crowd that is crowding in on him, he offers a Jewish blessing. You know what the word means, blessing there? Eucharist. In the middle of this scene, Jesus is again foreshadowing this. The blessing of grace through him. So, he offers this up. He's doing this in this pagan environment amongst these fallen idolaters. And what happens? 4,000 people are fed with seven baskets of leftovers. Keep that seven in mind. We're going to come back to that in just one second. What he is doing right here, his very act due to his divine nature is the presentation of a covenantal meal that was so prevalent in the ancient Near East and in the Old Testament. When a sovereign or a lord, and in our case, Yahweh, engaged in a covenantal agreement with his subjects, he would express who he is. He gives a historical account of what he had done in this covenant. Then he lays out the requirements. He lays out these stipulations for both parties that they have to agree. And then with the sacrifice ratifying the covenant, when that sacrifice ratifying the covenant was completed, this sovereign, this Lord or God, in our case, Yahweh, would then invite the parties to participate with that God in a covenantal meal. Exodus 24. Remember Exodus 24? With the establishment of the tabernacle, they offer the sacrifice, the burnt offering, and then what happens? Yahweh calls Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and the 70 elders up to the second level of Mount Sinai, God descends from the cloud and he eats and drinks his covenantal meal with his people. Jesus is repeating that in the New Testament. This is what Jesus is foreshadowing in this morning's gospel. The meal was offered by God. They ate, and there was so much bread left over, it filled seven baskets, seven loaves. The number of perfection in Scripture. God created the universe in seven days. The seventh day is to be hallowed. The one in seven principle is replete throughout Scripture. Jesus goes into this pagan Gentile, ungodly environment. He exercises a demon out of a pagan woman's daughter. He heals a pagan man mute from birth. He then reenacts the covenantal meal with a pagan multitude demonstrating that he is God over all Gentile and Jew. Believer and pagan. And he is pointing out to everyone that contrary to what some may have believed, grace would be given to non-Jews. Grace would be given to the Gentiles. The bread, the grace of Christ is so powerful. It is so transcendent that even seven mere loaves abounds in Excess, even in a sinful world. And even that he wasn't directly ministering to the Gentiles at the time, as in the case of the woman in chapter 7, the bread falling off the table would provide sustenance. His grace will always benefit those with whom he came in contact. 
Now, this is not saving grace. Don't, don't confuse what happened in this chapter with people, all these multitude being saved. That wasn't the point. The point was to demonstrate Christ's sovereignty in both the Gentile and Jewish environments and that his grace overabounds. This is what we would call common grace. The merciful actions of God given to everyone regardless of their relationship with him. The rain, the sun, food from the earth, etc. It shines, it provides for the just and the unjust. This is the grace that is received by everyone. This is the grace that is received today by all alive. This is the type of grace that is the product of the cross. Wherefore the believer, the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus is distributed to us in the bread and the wine, his body and his blood. But for the unbeliever, it offers a temporary, a mere respite from God's impending and inevitable judgment. The overabundance of grace of the cross gives the unbeliever time to repent. As Paul says, now is the appointed time. Now is the day of salvation, but that time is limited. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, who knoweth our necessities before we ask in our ignorance and ask, we beseech you to have compassion upon our infirmities and those things which for our unworthiness we dare not ask and for our blindness we cannot ask. Vouchsafe to give us for the worthiness of the Son of God.